Good day to you. My name is Mike Gingrich, and I'm the co-founder of Tab Site. And uh, glad to be hosting you today for this webinar on maximizing Facebook marketing for nonprofits. And we do have a special guest with us, John Hayden of uh, Inbound Zombie, and he's going to be doing the majority of the presenting today. Uh, just a few things that I want to go over as we get started and I'm going to take you through a little bit of a agenda but uh, we always get the question and the answer is always yes there will be a video made of this webinar and we will process it after we're finished here we're expecting this to be a one hour webinar and I will be posting that later on today you'll be able to find it at tapsite.com slash webinars but uh, everyone who registered will be emailed that as well we'll post it on our blog and our Facebook page and via Twitter uh, speaking of Twitter if you do want to ask questions or uh, tweet about things that you're learning during the webinar today feel free to use the hashtag tabsite NP NP for nonprofit debt so hashtag tabsite NP and uh, we'll be following those tweets as we go uh, let's see, I'm going to move on to the agenda here. All right, so I'm going to introduce you to John, our guest presenter for the day, and he's going to be doing the majority of the input on Facebook marketing, specifically geared for nonprofits. We will have about 30 minutes of uh, input, and we're going to have a question and answer time period at the end. So feel free to be posting those questions in the uh, GoToWebinar area uh, or on Twitter, and we'll be watching for those and answering those at that time. As well, at the end of the webinar, we're going to be announcing the winner of the TabSite Gold Plan that's uh, free for life to one participating attendee, and I will have a uh, special discount code for tab site at the end of this as well. So to begin, I want to introduce John to you and, and uh, let him go into a little bit more detail uh, through his presentation. But uh, John is a founder of Inbound Zombie, a new media for nonprofits organization where he does uh, consulting and uh, websites. Uh, social media consulting for nonprofits. He is the author of uh, Facebook Marketing for Dummies, and I believe he is working on a revision of that now, so there's going to be some uh, new materials coming out. He is the founder of the Social Media Fundraising Club, partner at Social Bright, and uh, does a lot of presenting. Uh, Charity How To is one of those organizations, and also at Blog World and other various events. Hosting webinars is a common thing for John, so we're looking forward to his input today. And uh, John is, uh, you know, a celebrity, really. And uh, if you, you know, I haven't seen him on the cover of uh, GQ or Sports Illustrated yet, but uh, look at this digital marketing, uh, where he's uh, made the headline cover in December, and uh, he's a cover boy that we are uh, glad to have with us today. They airbrushed this so much, it's amazing. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that the case, John? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> so, so with that, I want to uh, pass things over to John and uh, allow him to introduce himself. So, John, why don't you uh, greet folks here as I pass it, the uh, baton over to you, and we'll go on. Beautiful. Okay. So everybody, welcome, um, and I'm, I'm excited about this. I mean, I love working with nonprofits. That's you know, the reason why I got into this kind of work. I used to work on the for-profit side, and the reason why I got into this kind of work is because I wanted to sleep better at night and actually have kind of a bigger impact on the world, um, particularly having a son. I, he's nine now, but this is many years ago. I started reflecting as a parent. Um, so that's the way, why I'm doing the work that I do. But but I offer a, a different perspective than most nonprofit consultants. Most nonprofit consultants come from the nonprofit world. That's pretty much their experience. I come from the for-profit world, so it's a much more experience on technology and marketing. In, in my in my background, that's what I've found. So now th this is the topic today. We're we're actually going to dig into 
the most um, <clears throat> kind of pressing um, questions, concerns that, that I find that nonprofits have, and I've done tons of webinars, so I've heard all, most of the questions, and I'm sure you'll have other questions today that I haven't heard. So um, we're going to talk about, first of all, an effective marketing plan, creating a a really good Facebook marketing plan, the basics of that, um, <clears throat> understanding what nodes are, or your community, and, and the, the whole point of Facebook. We'll talk about edge rank. Some of you may not know what that is. Configuring your page for engagement. So some of you may have a Facebook page where it's actually set up a slightly incorrectly, where you're, you're kind of um, impeding the ability for the page to spread, or for your, for your organization to spread throughout the world of Facebook. Uh, when should I post content? That's a, always a common question. When? Um, photos, text updates we're going to talk about, and then find, well, towards the end we're going to talk about raising money. Can you actually raise money with Facebook? And then we'll talk about Facebook ads, some, a really amazing feature within Facebook ads that, that you're going to love. You probably haven't heard of it, but you're going to love this one. All right? So uh, to create a Facebook marketing plan, um, <clears throat> well, really the foundation, this is the foundation. So. When I work with organizations or when I do webinars, you know, often I'll, uh, I'll um, learn that organizations are kind of three steps ahead of where they should be, right? So they say, well, what do we do on Facebook? How do we do this? How do we create more awareness? How do we raise money? How do we do this, right? And I say, well, great. Well, tell me about your organization. Who are you? And always they don't have an answer. Who are you? What's your personality? What do you represent? How is that different from other brands? Right? And brand is not a common discussion that we have in the nonprofit world, but it is so in the for-profit world. And I'll give you an example of brand, what brand means. It's essentially your personality. It's the feeling that people have about you or what they say about you behind your back. Right? Uh, it's the overall kind of impression that they have of you, the feeling that they get from you. Um, and brand is different from your mission. Right? So the, the National Wildlife Federation and Greenpeace have similar missions. They are there to protect wildlife. They are there to preserve the environment and, and conservation. But their brands are totally different. Greenpeace, let's get in some boats, get arrested in front of a whale, and get you know, cause some trouble, be very political. National Wildlife Federation, cute pandas, families, kids. Okay? two completely different brands. It's important to understand what your brand is, what it represents, uh, not what you think it should represent, but what it actually represents. And that's where you have to really understand your audience. How do they think about you? Uh, that is similar to brand, but, but audience is really more to what's going to make your people do something. Right? The purpose of Facebook, the sole purpose, is to encourage people to talk about you. Like, comment, and share. That's the that's the name of the game on book. That's it. Okay. Now, the what you need to do is you need to create a message, or you could say content, that is a connection. In other words, like when you ha when you understand your brand, when you understand your brand, and you really really get who your people are, the type of content that you post on Facebook, it really just makes sense. It, it's 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 not that hard after you understand those first two. But these are fundamental um, <clears throat> aspects of your organization should always be working on. It's always a work in process. You never really do arrive. But uh, seeking to understand the brand and the audience and seeking to post better and better content to connect with your audience as a peer, as a friend, um, <clears throat> that's going to be the foundation, the fundamental foundation for your success on Facebook. Okay, now we're going to get a little bit more specific. Um, there is a workbook that you can download. You can just go to this link that I'm showing you at the bottom of the screen, and you'll get these slides later on. But there's a workbook that gets into creating a Facebook marketing plan step by step. Okay, uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, understanding your community and why that is also a very core part of success on Facebook. The whole name of the game on Facebook is to get people to talk about you. And when you are in the um, situation, which probably most of you are, where you're saying, we have a Facebook page, now what? We have a Facebook page, we need to get more fans. We have a Facebook page, we want people to engage with us more. What do we do? Where do we start? Okay? And the place that you start is with people who are already past the honeymoon phase. They're in your database. They're subscribers. They're donors. They're volunteers. They don't need any convincing at all. You're not trying to sell them. You're just 
trying to create a situation where you're encouraging them to naturally tell their friends. Okay? So let's go just repeat this again. You have your community, people in your database, and your network. Your network is your communities, friends, uh, family, acquaintances, high school friends, college friends, and so forth. Okay? This is exactly what Facebook is for. Okay? You encourage your community to talk, like, comment, and share, and naturally they spread that message about how awesome you are to their friends and family. And then those people get pulled into the vortex of your cause. It really does work that way. Okay? So um, one you know, other thing that's very important to understand on, on Facebook, and a lot of organizations that I talk to, they are suddenly shocked when they realize that not all of their fans see their content. In fact, most of your Facebook fans that have liked your Facebook page don't see your updates in their newsfeed. Okay, that, that's a fact. Okay? And why is this? It's because of this uh, algorithm that Facebook has developed called EdgeRank. Okay? Now, uh, you know, simply stated, um, EdgeRank is basically an algorithm, it's a math thing, that uh, determines whether a specific update, a specific photo, a text update, whatever it might be, will appear in a specific person's news, uh, news feed. Okay? So it ranks the individual updates. It doesn't really rank your page. It doesn't rank your page, it ranks the updates. It indirectly ranks your page. So for example, if you are posting consistently bad content, then eventually your page will be seen less and less and less. So in that sense, your page does get ranked, but it's indirect. It's a result of your content. Okay? Now, this is what the algorithm looks like, uh, and I'm gonna, just going to describe what it, uh, what it means. And then why? Why is it important to understand what edge rank is? Okay? There are th really three factors that come into play with edge rank. One is the relationship, or what Facebook calls affinity. It's the relationship between the individual person and the Facebook page. So let's say Mike is the Facebook user, and he is a fan of the National Wildlife Federation. But he, he simply likes the page. He rarely interacts with anything. In fact, he hasn't really interacted with any updates at all. It's highly unlikely that Mike will actually see updates from the National Wildlife Federation because his affinity is kind of low. It's not really high at all, okay? as expressed by his actions, his actual historical actions. Right? The second part is how people talk about a specific story. So if you publish a photo on your page, it starts getting like, a lot of likes, comments, and shares. The algorithm, the algorithm works such that it will be pushed out to more of your fans and more of their friends by way of that uh, talking about this. Okay? Liking, commenting, and sharing, naturally their friends see that content in the process. Okay? That's called viral reach. All right? uh, and then finally, the, the third factor here is how recently the story was published. So if you post a photo on on a Tuesday at 2 o'clock, and most of your fans are at work, and they, they're not going to look at their Facebook newsfeed until 8 o'clock at night after the kids have had dinner, then your update, for all intents and purposes, is, is basically invisible. They're never, ever going to even know that you posted something. So the key is to really post when they are there on Facebook. Okay? And we're going to get into that a little bit later. Um, so the reason why um, you have to understand what edge rank is because um, you'll understand that when you get people to talk about you, the more people talk about you, the more that Mike likes, comments, and shares of photo, photos and text updates and whatnot from the National Wildlife Federation, the more likely he'll continue to see updates in his newsfeed. Okay, so that affinity always has to be there. Um, it's almost like um, you know. Um, you're, always, you're only as good as your last update. You really are only as good as your last update, right? If you post a great photo and that was awesome last week, you can't just lay down and say, oh, that's great, you know? No, you have to actually keep winning people's affinity, you know, day by day, week after week. Um, the other, you know, thing to think about is that, um, I say here, you win in the newsfeed when people talk about your content, when they increasingly talk about your content. You can skirt edge rank with other channels. Okay? So edge rank 
you might think, um, some people have said this, that, oh, it's not fair. You know, Facebook is purposefully hiding content from my fans when they've already liked my page. That's totally unfair, okay? You know, life is unfair, okay? Actually, life is not unfair. It's, it's, it's impartial. And edge rank is not unfair. Edge rank is impartial, okay? Edge rank is not have any agenda, personal agenda, or dislike people because of whatever, right? Um, it's just purely impartial. It's an algorithm. It's impartial. Uh, so you can skirt this issue, though, using other channels. So, for example, if you post a photo update, you can send an email out to your email list and say, hey, we just posted this photo. Check it out. And then send people from your email list to that photo. And what does that do? Going back to what we talked about earlier, that leverages your community, the people that already love you. Those are the people you need to go to first. Okay, um, and you know number three, you have to publish content that they love, right? Uh, there's also promoted posts you can use on your page, but use them wisely. Don't promote just any update. Promote only the best stuff because you're paying for reach. You're not paying for anything else. If you promote an update that's horrible and actually has not gotten any comments, likes, or shares then paying for reach is throwing money out the window. It's literally throwing money out the window because there's no long-term gain, all right? Again, the whole game is to get people to like, comment, share your updates, right? Um, and then the fifth is probably, um, you know, one of the most overlooked, uh, you know, approaches. You know, usually when I work with nonprofits, you know, they focus a lot on posting content, posting content, posting content, but very rarely do they spend time following up with commenters and actually creating this discussion in the actual thread of each update and that spending the time and paying attention that goes a long way to building a community it's like you're a gardener you're a farmer you have to plant the seeds water and weed the garden every single day it's no different at all okay so before we jump into you know specific things like when to post and what to post and how it works and all that you know, we need to make sure that our Facebook page is actually set up to take advantage of what Facebook truly is, which is kind of a viral, um, it's word of mouth, really, on, on steroids or, or scaled, okay? But we really can't take advantage of it unless we have our page set up correctly. So in your Facebook page, there's a section called Manage Permissions, and there are four areas that you have to select that will enable your page to to um, get the most exposure. One is posting ability. You want people to post to your page. Uh, post visibility is not necessarily that important, but if you have an organization where community is really important to you, uh, then you might want to display the most recent posts at the top of your page, but this is not um, that important. Tagging ability and also replies. Those are important. So you just simply check off these items, and here's a screenshot right here. Okay, so um, posting ability again. Everyone can post anything and wh whatever they can just post to our page. Okay, some organizations I've spoken with, they're very concerned about that. People are going to post hateful stuff. What do we do? There are moderation uh, settings on the page, so you can actually block content if it has a specific keyword in it. So that's that's fine. But let's talk about the upside of this. When we check off posting ability. What happens, let's say Mike goes to the National Wildlife Federation after he just went on this really great hike, and he, he brought his digital camera, took a picture of a, a, a red fox running in the woods. And Mike's never seen a red fox before. He's excited. He goes to the National Wildlife Federation's uh, fi uh, Facebook, National Wildlife Federation's Facebook page, posts that photo. Guess what happens? Mike's friends are then exposed to the National Wildlife Federation. If they show, if they have chosen to deselect these items, then that opportunity is lost. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Tagging ability, same idea. I've worked with organizations that do a lot with photos, you know, because they have lots of events. If you do events, which most of you do, some type of event, post only the best photos. Don't post every single photo because they're most of them, quite frankly, are boring. Don't take that personally, but they're just boring. Some guy sitting in the corner. Who cares about that? You want to post pictures that are interesting, funny, and have a story in and of themselves, and then and encourage your fans. You know, tag your friend. You know, tag your friend. Your friend. Do you see anybody you know here? Tag them. Make it a fun game. 
Um, a couple of situations I've worked with, a couple of organizations I've worked with where we've actually blacked out the faces of people in a specific photo and then play, made it even more of a game. You know, can you guess who these people are? Tag them and pass it along. Something very simple like that. There's a new feature as well in the bottom here. We have replies. So uh, pages now have the ability to have threaded comments, which means that you can reply to a comment within a page update, much like you would in a blog post, you know, replying back and forth in, in two levels of, of, of uh, comments. Okay? Now what this does is this creates more uh, viral reach and more engagement because when someone leaves a comment on your photo, then uh, the, you can reply to them, and then they get a notification. So-and-so replied to your comment on this photo. Okay, so then they're pulled back to the update, back to the photo to, to see what you wrote. You know, oh, that's great. Okay, so it's a really great way to build that deeper engagement within the update. Okay? So let's talk about when to post, right? When to post, because this is kind of a big issue, but fortunately, there are many companies out there that do a lot of research on this. So we actually have a lot of really good data. One is Buddy Media. They found that there's a 20% higher rate of engagement for posts that are published in the morning and the evening. Okay? And I love these studies that basically confirm common sense. Okay? If you use Facebook, and I'm hoping most of you do, you know that you use Facebook mostly in the morning and the evening. Right? You get up in the morning, it's the new morning paper drink in your coffee, you look at Facebook, then you go to work, you come home, you do your thing at night, and then finally, 8 o'clock at night, you open up Facebook. Okay? HubSpot found the same exact uh, data, more so in the nighttime. They found a lot more at nighttime. These are two different studies, two different groups of pages. This one, a HubSpot study I like because it, it used um, the, the top, oh, I want to say the top 10,000 Facebook pages with about 20, 12 million updates. They looked at about 12 million updates. So that's a lot of data. And they found 8 p.m. is best for comments and likes, 6 p.m. for shares. Okay? And, and so the question arises, you know, well, well great. That, that's, that's what we need to start doing. Yes, start posting. It's 8 p.m., 6 p.m. at night. That's great. But know that your community is going to be different. Your community is not the average of the top 10,000 Facebook pages. You need to confirm this with your insights. Insights is an analytic module that, that comes with all Facebook pages and you can export the data. Uh, they have graphs and fancy looking charts and whatnot, but to find out the time that works best for you is you export the post level data. There's a column that has the date and time in it. You have kind of to scrub it a little bit because it does have the date and the time in one cell, which is kind of a pain. But once you do that, you can um, you know, rank it by the number of uh, comments, likes and shares, or virality, and then the time of day. You can kind of sort it all and then figure out and you can see patterns. Wow, actually this is the best time that works for us. Okay? So if you don't know what works for you, try posting at the nighttime. See if that actually improves things. Right? Now many of you work from 9 to 5 and you're saying right now, wow, 8 o'clock at night, that's great. but I'm busy. I can't really do it at that point. So fortunately, you can schedule an update on your Facebook page. Okay? Any single update, and this is the publisher, this is a screenshot of the publisher on, on your Facebook page or on a Facebook page. Simply pick the date, month, um, you know, date during the month, time, minutes, and so forth. Okay? Publisher update, it goes into the activity log. You can edit it if you want to, or I'm sorry, delete it or reschedule it if you want to, before it goes off, you always can go back into your activity log. And then that way you're setting something up to go off at 8 o'clock at night when you don't, you're not able to be there. But you can just schedule in advance. You can also do the th same thing on the Facebook Pages Manager app. Okay? This is the iPhone and Android. You can simply schedule a date in the future. Uh, right now it's only available for text updates, not photos. But you know, that I'm sure that will change. There's also Post Planner, which I love. Absolutely a huge fan of Post Planner. And it's free uh, for, with, for certain features. Free for, I believe, one page. But definitely check that out because you, you're uh, given the ability to schedule updates. You can fill up your whole calendar. You can get, uh, you know, repeat updates um, throughout, you know, over the months and so forth. And you can actually measure 
how the updates are doing. It has their own sets of insights in the in post planner. So that's something really worthwhile for you to check out. Okay. Hey, hey John, one interjection yeah. there, and that is that sure. uh, post planner is uh, running a special for for uh, friends of tab site right now. And so their guru plan, which is the, one of the more advanced ones with the content uh, ideas and all that that you mentioned, is 50% mm. uh, off for the first three months uh, right now through April 1st by going to Post Planner and at checkout for the guru entering you know the code tab site. Oh, beautiful. Wow, that's great. And I love, actually, I use the guru plan myself, not because I'm a guru, but, mm -hmm. but I love that content curation part of it. So you can actually get ideas based on um, you know, specific topic areas or categories, and, and I love that. And you can put in Twitter followers that you love, and, and it, will, it will show you updates from those Twitter followers that, that you can also pull that content. It's a content curation engine is what they're creating, which I love. I think it's brilliant. You know? um, so that's great that they have that that uh, that uh, that you guys are doing a you know a, a special like that a promotion, excellent. Um, so po posting photos now, uh, most of you probably heard that photos do really well. Like photos are the best thing we should post on Facebook. You you really should mix it up because you have to understand that everybody's different. People react to content in different ways. In general, photos do really well. If you post only photos, you're actually neglecting the people that like text updates. They might like that better, you know, or you might get different people responding to different types of updates. So diversity of content is really important. Um, but why do photos work? Why is it that photos are really the big deal on Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, all these other sites? Photos are, are very, becoming very important. The Internet is essentially becoming a big picture book. Okay? Um, and the reason why is because images actually speak to the unconscious. right? And the, when we say when I say unconscious, I mean you know more specifically the limbic system, which is the this earlier part of our brain in evolution evolutionary history, when we were like say some very primitive rodent that 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 um, is the seat of like action. You know, I see you know a raccoon is chasing me. I I'm scared. I'm going to do something. So the limbic system was what's critical about this is that this is also the place where action takes place. When someone decides to do something, click on a button to donate to your organization when they're on your website, subscribe to an email, forward something, share something. They're doing it because it's an emotion. There's an emotion tied to it, and that's where fundamental basic actions are based. Okay, very important decisions are based as well. Like getting married. You don't when you get married to someone. You don't say, "Oh, well, geez, let me get my Excel document and really." kind of examine why and da, 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 and do this higher level of, of uh, analytical thinking. No, it's pure emotion. It's just emotion. I feel safe with this person that, or whatever the emotion might be. <laughs> I'm not safe. <laughs> I found the only woman that I feel <laughs> safe with. Like, that is not a woman you should marry, <laughs> just for the record, okay? <laughs> if that's the only criteria you have, you gotta, you got to keep looking. Okay? Keep your Match.com profile up. Um, the other thing about images is that they, they actually take out much more pure real estate in the news feed. Right? So just from a raw attention standpoint, um, if I'm looking at my Facebook news feed and the news feed flies by for a lot of your, your fans and supporters, um, you have to understand that photos are actually going to grab their attention just from a pure real estate standpoint. Okay? So which one am I going to pay, pay attention to? The, in this example, it will be the one on the top. You know, it captures my attention. At least I've got to investigate even a split second more. I might click on it and look at it, but you've got my attention, which is a fraction of a section. Fraction of a second. That's a bigger advantage over the text updates, right? Um, and and also, uh, you know, pictures actually take up on mobile devices, which there's a, the growing, um, you know, uh, numbers on Facebook are more and more people using mobile devices. So I think there are about 700 million people accessing Facebook every single month using a mobile device. There are about 1 billion people altogether. So 70% of people are accessing Facebook through a mobile device like an iPhone. Pictures on an iPhone, if you go to Facebook on your iPhone, a picture takes up the entire screen. Okay? There's no competition at all in the news feed. So for text updates, that is not the case. All right, there's always competition with text updates. Okay? Uh, post photos that have some story to it. I mentioned this earlier. So don't just post a photo of your, say, say you have a new person that started working at your organization. Uh, this is a true story with an organization I spoke to the other day. 
um, they said, oh, we posted a picture of our interns, an intern working there you know, part-time. And they're just standing there, and they really didn't look that happy. And I said, it's just this girl standing there. There's no story to it. She's not really doing anything. There's nothing happening in the picture. Okay, So make sure that your photos actually have something happening in there. Uh, in other words, you, you don't really need any other information. You could just look at the picture and, and know that there's something go going on. Right? So make sure they have a, uh, a story going on. This is a great example from the uh, Humane Society of the United States where they um, kind of found this picture, they found this quote, first of all, from the pork producers industry, nothing against pork, by the way, um, but you know, they found this quote, which is like not really that great if you're a humane society uh, you know, supporter, and they said this is not great. It got them outraged, got them angry. Okay? They put that together with a picture of this pig who's obviously not in a comfortable position in, in this little cage. And this was one of their most viral updates um, for about a three to six month period. Okay, so this is a really great example, a great case study here. Okay, and, and even in the text, you can see they say, "What the heck?" Like, "What? Ah, I'm mad." Okay, um, and also leverage emotion. So here's another one. This is one of the best updates from a breast, a local breast cancer found, uh, foundation in the, in the Massachusetts area, in the Boston area, um, and it's very clear. It's so Get, it's so getting at the core emotion that people feel about breast cancer. You know, it's not just a thing that happens in October. It happens and it impacts families, children, husbands, boyfriends, girlfriends, every single day. Okay? Share this update if you know someone impacted by breast cancer. So what's powerful about this update also is that it, it, it uses a condition. It's not saying share this. I command you to share this. It's saying share this if. So it's really what's happening is that identify yourself. Stand up. You can, with one mouse click, just by sharing this, you're making a statement about your life. I know someone who has breast cancer. That's me. I'm going to share this. Okay? That's what makes this really powerful. Now, uh, if you're not get, catching on here, uh, basically emotions are the core of any action on the internet, and specifically with Facebook, liking, commenting, and sharing, really uh, the more you can kind of tug or pull at someone's emotion, the better you're going to be. And there was some research from uh, the New York Times. I love the New York Times because they were almost flattened by Twitter as a business. They were almost completely, they almost went out of business because of social media, completely changed the whole newspaper industry. But now they're one of the leading researchers on how people use social media and what motivates them and how, how it all works, how people and the internet all works. And this is one study they found is that you know, the, the emotions that really trigger sharing are anger, awe, and anxiety. Okay, anger, awe, and anxiety. Now you could, there's only one, one out of these three are, you could say are positive. Awe is like a positive emotion. But anger in a sense is a positive emotion too, particularly if it's righteous anger. And many of you work for organizations where you can tap into that so easily, okay? Just like the, the Humane Society did. This is not right. Pigs deserve better. Share this if you agree, okay? That's really tapping into that righteous anger. And this is, you know, this is, this is how it works, okay? Now, in terms of photos, um, one great thing I like about photos is that you, it's the only update on Facebook that you can actually edit. It's the only update on Facebook you can edit. So if you post a photo and you find that it's actually getting a lot of activity, lots of shares, lots of comments, lots of likes, you can always edit the description and add a URL back to your website that's related to that photo. Okay? Um, photos work to some degree better than um, just a pure link on Facebook. If you're going to post a link to a donation page or to a petition or something like that, a photo that really gets people going, that's really compelling and amazing. This photo isn't necessarily that amazing, but you know the one earlier from the Humane Society, something like that just went completely viral. And you know they might have the opportunity to have a petition signed. You know, sign a petition for this against the pork producers industry. You know, send them a message. Let's send them a message. Click here, sign the petition. So because the photo goes, a photo is generally more viral uh, than text updates on Facebook a link will travel around with a photo a lot better than if it was um, 
you know, just post it as a link. Not in every situation, but in, in, in many situations, okay? Um, the other thing about photos is that if you do find that a photo is performing very well on your Facebook page, why not take that and post it on Pinterest or, uh, you know, Instagram or, or any other photo type of site that you're, that you're using where you have a community and then edit the, um, in this case we're editing a Pinterest uh, pin with a link, a permalink back to the update. So what this does is that as that photo gets shared, I'm sorry, repinned all over Pinterest, it's actually increasing the exposure for that update on Facebook. So you're actually bringing, using another channel to, again, skirt the edge rank issue. You're basically pushing people directly to that update. You're not relying on Facebook to display it in news feeds or not. You're, you're pushing people to that update to react to it, okay? And again, when they react to it, what happens? Their friends see that. That's why Facebook is so critical. Facebook is built on a massive network, um, you know, 140 billion friendships, okay? These friendships are actual friendships, right? If you're on Twitter, you know that most ties on Twitter are are weak, weak ties. Twitter, the focus is the content, and that's a great video, I like that, and you meet people, and um, but, but generally speaking, the, t the ties are weak, you know. I'm not saying you don't have good friends on Twitter, that's not, that's not it, but, but Facebook is where all your real friends are. High school friends, college friends, ex-girlfriends, ex-boyfriends, you know, um, you know, um, husbands, wives, families, whoever. I mean, real people, real connections are, are strong ties, so people are more likely to share. And Facebook has done a lot of research on this as well. They found that uh, basically strong ties rely heavily on friendships, uh, but, but actually content that's great, really awesome content that stands on its own, gets shared more among weak ties. Because a friend, you know, let's say Mike and I are, are good friends on Facebook, and I consider us good friends because I see his updates, and so Facebook actually proves, Facebook says we're good friends. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, yeah. um, but, you know, I see his updates. He sees my updates, I, I have no idea. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, so, but if I find something um, from someone, say a Facebook page that I, you know, uh, that's not necessarily in my friend network, I'm going to be more likely to share it if it's a great piece of content, because I want to be the first, the first person in my friend network to share something, okay? So I, I went on a slight tangent here, we're going to keep going. Um, now, let's get into text updates. So text updates, um, Buddy Media found, you know, again, more research on this, basically um, comment rates more than double when you ask a question. And again, another study that just confirms common sense, right? Questions. When you ask a question, you're more likely to get an answer. I mean, I could have, I could have put together the study. Um, but what uh, we're finding is that closed questions actually perform way better than open-ended questions. Now, in school, we all learned, especially like in, in middle school or grammar, grammar school, you learn, oh, op ask open questions, then you create dialogue and friendship and everybody's happy. But no, Facebook is closed questions, okay? And here we see types of uh, questions get more common, certain types of questions. Most of them are closed in this situation, okay? Um, <clears throat> so in terms of these closed questions, I'll just give you some tips here. Uh, be very specific. So don't say, how do you feel about the environment? Do you feel like there's still global, you know, uh, you know wh how do you feel about global warming? No, that's way too general, okay? Relevance is important too. Preference questions, yes, you know, do you like this or that? Choice questions, yes or no, fill in the blank. Um, these are just some examples from my, one of my Facebook pages that I deal with. Um, and I'm, I'm always doing experiments, but these, these three specific kind of formats or approaches tend to work really well. And I've tried these with other organizations as well, and they tend to work really well. Why? Why do they work? <clears throat> because they're very specific, and they're telling people what to expect, and they're, they're almost doing their job for them, okay? In all of these updates, for example, yes or no, in the top left, yes or no, the Facebook user, in their mind, they're thinking, oh, I can do that. It's either yes or no. I can completely handle this. Uh, the second one down, all I need to do is type in a letter, A, B, or C. That's it. I'm done. I can move on. Okay, so very simple, closed questions that are highly specific and almost like leading the witness. Um, in, in all of these instances, there's a, you know, you know all caps, to actually quick poll, poll. It's telling people what's expected of them right away. Okay, so they can quickly, oh, great, I, that's what's required. I'm just going to do that and move on. 
Okay. Obviously, the question has to be interesting too. That's important. Um, so, can you actually raise money on Facebook? This is the sixty-four thousand dollar question, um, and the answer is yes. You can raise money with Facebook. You can't necessarily raise money on Facebook, and there's some research on this as well. So, Blackbaud and another company called Razu have done research on transactions, you know, conversions with donations. And what they found is that social media in general is converting a donation at about three to five percent. Okay, three to five percent. Um, email, on the other hand, is thirty-three percent. So what this means is that if you share a link on Facebook or Twitter, let's say, um, that is a donation link, and you say, "Hey, click, you know, donate," right, and you send out a tweet or, or an update on your Facebook page, a hundred people click on that link, three people finish the job, three people pull out their credit card and actually finish the job. Email is very different. Email is 33%. You send out an email, 100 people click on the link in the email, 33 of those 100 people, 33 out of those 100 people will finish the job. So email is much more effective at the transactional part of fundraising. Now we all know that fundraising is much more than just transactions, okay? It's about relationships, right? And so when people make the argument that you can't raise money with Facebook, my um, argument is that, well, it's a tool, Facebook is a tool like a handshake, and it's really best used for certain things and not really so well at other things. Like you would never try and collect money from someone when you're shaking their hand. That would just be completely inappropriate. So handshake is a, an appropriate tool to establish rapport, um, trust, and nurture relationships. Facebook is essentially the same thing. Okay. Um, it's relational. It's not transactional. Email is more of a transactional medium. Okay. So how do we resolve all this stuff? How do we resolve all this stuff? Um, you know, first of all, we have to understand that the real goal of Facebook, and I've mentioned this several times in this webinar, it's really the real goal is to get our core people telling their friends about how awesome the organization is, and that's it, or how great the cause is, or to join us in the cause. Okay. That's basically the entire point of Facebook. Okay. Um, and we need to work with our core people to nurture those long-term relationships and so that they, so that they actually do that. Okay? Um, and the other factor in this is you have to understand, so, so where does email fit into all of this? You know, where does email fit into all of this? Um, <clears throat> email actually fits in this continuum of what you might call affinity and, and trust. Um, so this is a, what you might call like a ladder of engagement. Okay, on Facebook as it pertains to Facebook, and it's a model. It's a scenario. It's a very common scenario where, you know, going at the bottom of the stairs, people become aware of your cause because a friend has talked about your cause, and then they might like, comment, and share an update. They'll continue to engage. They might like or uh, like your page. They might not, um, but at some point they might actually advocate or, or you know sign a petition or join an email list. Then through the email marketing. Then you're converting those donations, okay? And then what happens after that? They make a donation, then they share that fact that they did that on Facebook. So that's how the whole thing ties together. Um, now going up this stairway, we see there's an increase of trust and affinity within the person. So this continuum, okay? Some people are going to drop off. That's why we see smaller and smaller steps going up. So lots of people might be aware of your organization. But a subset, a very small subset of those people will actually join your email list, and then a subset of those people, your email list, will actually donate for the first time. Okay? So it's like a, an upside down funnel is what we're really looking at here. Okay? Um, so email acquisition is really the way to tie the two together. So approaching Facebook as an email acquisition um, tool, but um, primarily as a tool that gets your people talking, and then secondarily, running campaigns and strategies to do email acquisition. Okay? Um, there's also Facebook ads that you can use for fundraising. Um, and you can actually target specific segments with Facebook ads. Very quickly, uh, Facebook has a feature that allows you to reach um, <coughs> lapsed donors. Um, you can push specific content uh, specific posts to um, people based on their donor level, you know, like, a, like an update uh, on a specific project, very specific proje uh, project on your Facebook page. You take a picture of a school that's being built, say, in Tanzania, 
and then you can push that out to people who have actually donated to similar schools in Tanzania. Okay, you can get very specific. So the way this works is that um, you take an email list from your donor database or your email list or your volunteer database, whatever it might be, and you take that specific segment. So let's stay with the, this idea of, well, let's say, lapsed donors. Okay? You, have a, you have that list inside your organization. You have that list. These are people that have not given us a penny in about six months or a year. Okay? We need to touch them. How do we reach them? They never return our emails. They don't pick up the phone. Guess where they are? They're on Facebook. Okay? So you take that single column of emails, you upload it into um, what's called the Power Editor on Facebook, and Facebook will actually match up the Facebook users with those emails. Right now, um, and it will show you how many people were a match. So you upload an email list of say 8,000 people, Facebook makes a match of say 6,000. Now you're able to target those 6,000 people. Okay, and you can combine that with other targeting criteria. Okay, there's a video tutorial here you can look at that gets into more detail on this. Um, and then once you do that, once you upload that list, then you can select it from the targeting criteria within Facebook ads. You can combine that with other targeting criteria like I just mentioned. Okay? So that's basically it. I wanted to cover some, some essential tactics and also more advanced um, strategies for, for building, building up your presence on Facebook. And now, now we can open it up for questions. Yeah, let's see. Um, I've noticed a few of them in here, John, and um, I'm going to go through a few of those. All right, there was a question about uh, scheduled post. Uh, do they garner the same visibility as live post? And I think this is when you're talking about uh, post planner, or scheduled post, that area. So do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, Mike, thank you. Um, so scheduled posts do, this, there's no difference between a scheduled post and a regular post. It's just that it's, it's um, kind of queued up to go off at a time in the future, but it's, it's literally the same thing as publishing a Facebook update live. There's no difference at all. Um, in fact, um, if you're publishing an update at 8 and you schedule it for 8, it's going to get more engagement at 8 o'clock because there's people on Facebook seeing it for the first time in their newsfeed. It's at the top of their newsfeed. Then they're going to engage with it. So it actually, um, it's n the scheduling has no impact at all, but the time that you that the update goes off is critical. And by the way, it's local time. It's lo local time is what you want to think about. Not, you know, because I've gotten the question, is that east, east coast, mid, you know, west coast, what time is it? It's local time. Yeah, okay? local, yep. Uh, John, there was a question at the beginning when you're talking about um, branding a little bit, and the question was, is brand a preliminary but necessary stage of niche? Um, actually, it is a, I would say that niche, the idea of niche is a, um, a topic underneath brand. Okay, so brand is a huge um, concept that really covers a lot of things, like essentially, um, <clears throat> you know, who you are. Who, what's your, who you are as an organization is what I would call brand and how people feel about you when they read about you in the newspaper, when they interact with you on Facebook, when they get a phone call from you. It's, it's all the touch points in um, aggregate in terms of how it impacts a person. Now niche is a, is a subtopic within brand and that is, niche is, I would say that's more like a, a strategy to, to, to articulate your brand, right? So like the National Wildlife Federation, well, well, you know, we are not just a um, environmental organization. You know, this is what we really mean. We're family, kids, school, education, the future. We want, we want children and families to be outside in the world. And the more that they're outside in nature, the more that they're going to naturally protect nature. That's how they define their, their niche. That's kind of, well, that's their brand, but it's their niche. It's, niche really describes how you're different and unique from other organizations, and that is critical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. I love that question. Uh, let's see. There's a couple questions. I can answer this uh, very specifically about the video replay, the slides, and the uh, download link to the uh, Facebook Marketing Planner that you had mentioned. And uh, yes, all of those 
will be available afterwards. Everyone that registered will be emailed uh, access to those items as well as they'll be on our blog and Facebook page. But uh, if you've registered and you're here, you're covered. You'll get access to those. Um, Mike, I, I, can, I, I can email you a PDF of the slides too. Sounds good. If, if that helps, yeah. Yep, and, and uh, I'll be noting the link to where they're at on SlideShare as well. Um, Perfect. Let's see. John, they said there was a question about uh, docking edge rank. Does Post Planner um, have some docks in edge rank the way Hootsuite does? So that was a specific question ah, about post visibility, I think, and yeah, with uh, third party okay. apps. Beautiful question. I love this one. So, um, so the difference, that's such an awesome question, I love this one, because it is a, it's confusing, right? So Post Planner is a third-party app. It's not posting to Facebook directly, and so is Hootsuite, right? So, you know, you would assume that, oh, Post Planner, like Hootsuite, actually has, a, you get a little ding, or it hurts your ability to appear in news feeds. And for the most part, it really doesn't have to do with the technology at all. It has to do with the attitude behind the posting. So with um, Post Planner, you're actually using it specifically to post to Facebook. So you're optimizing the content specifically for Facebook. You're considering your community, your Facebook community, when you're using Post Planner, right? Hootsuite it do, uses, um, actually has the technology to do what's called cross-posting, which means oh, I'm on Twitter, I'm actually really on Twitter in real life, you know, and I'm using my little Hootsuite thing, and oh, what do you know, I can also check off Facebook and LinkedIn and Foursquare, God knows why you would want to post to Foursquare too, but, you know, I'm now selecting all these different things, now I hit publish, and I'm killing four or five birds with one stone. That's not going to work, okay? The reason why, particularly, it won't work particularly going from Twitter to Facebook because Facebook users don't know what retreats are, or they do know what they are, um, or hashtags, you know, they don't, miss, they don't really know what's going on, um, or, you know, and probably more to the point, it's, it's really a foreign language on Facebook. You know, if you're saying RT something hashtag, and it's actually in a Facebook news feed, it's clear that you're not even there, right? So why would I want to engage with you? And, and further, the problem with that Hootsuite is that there is that little Hootsuite icon that appears. So if you're a Twitter user like I am, you see that icon, and right away my first thought is, oh, this is clearly reposted. It's clearly just copy-paste. Someone's clearly being lazy. They're just not even present. Why should I, why should I interact with this? Okay? So that's the problem. Now, Post Planner doesn't really do that because the person, again, they're not doing the kill the many birds with one stone approach. There's not this lazy attitude. There's more like, what's going to work for each one of my specific Facebook community? And let me optimize the content specifically for Facebook. So that, that's the difference. But cross-posting is something that I often get into a lot. And I'm not really into cross-posting because it's just lazy. I mean, it's a, just an example of where, you know, just because you have the technology doesn't mean it's going to be the best thing in the world to use, you know? Yep, yep. Uh, John, there's a couple questions about email. Let's see. One said, uh, I thought we cannot send email to people who like our page. And then another was asking uh, about whether there's any, let's see here. Uh, legalities or uh, just ethics of uploading email addresses to Facebook without their consent for the ads. Okay, got it. All right, so that's two great questions, slightly related. The first question about, you know, I, oh, I thought you couldn't email fans, um, and you can't. And there is a pretty strong barrier between a person's pri privacy, their own individual privacy as a Facebook user, and brands. Like, there's a pretty good boundary between those two. And Facebook has set up a bunch of barriers around that. So let me get into that a little bit more. But the first point, my point here when I said, you know, use email as, a, as an external channel to push people to a Facebook update, I'm referring to emails that you already have, okay? I'm, you can't get an email from a Facebook fan unless they give you their email. You can get their email through an email acquisition strategy. Hey, here's a free ebook. Here's a webinar you can attend. Sign this petition. Um, you know, participate in this photo contest. All of those strategies are essentially email acquisition. Okay, 
they give you their email. They, they can do that, you know, but you just can't take it from the Facebook user, right? Um, so the, the, the comment about email is really using your email marketing um, database that you already have to kind of give your pa Facebook page a little bit more attention or um, exposure. You know, exposing your Facebook page to the people that already are sold on what you do. That's, that's really the point I was trying to make. Now with the Facebook ads, um, when you upload the email list, Facebook isn't going to show you the individual people that are attached to that email. Okay? They won't show you those profiles. Facebook will not show you those profiles. They'll simply say, oh, there are 6,000 people that you can uh, present a Facebook ad to. That's the only information you're going to get. So there is pretty, um, the privacy is, is respected. There's no legality or ethical issue. Um, you don't need a person's permission to upload an email list to Facebook. Someone's given your email. When someone signs your email list and they give it to you, it's your, it's your email, and you're telling them, we're not going to share your email with anybody else. You're not giving the email to Facebook. You're actually just using it to do targeting for your Facebook ads, but you're still having control or ownership of that email. Okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, John, there was a question about going back to the insights in terms of times to post. How did you figure that out again uh, with Facebook Insights? Okay, great question. Okay, so when you go to Insights, there is an export feature, and I'm showing you my screen right now. Um, there is an export feature, and you click on that, and you click Post Level Data. Okay, then um, you select either Excel or Comma Separated, whatever it might be. You download it, and then there's a column. That set that talk that I don't know the exact title of the column, but it is date and time. Okay, now you do have to scrub it. You have to take out the date. Um, what I often do is um, I'll put in time slots instead of the time. Okay, because what we want to really know is we don't want to know the exact time because we're never going to know. Oh wow, what do you know? 8:51 at night is really our best time. No, it'll be something like oh around 8 or between 7 and 8 p.m. works best. We're really looking for a range, okay, because there's never going to be a perfect time. So then you just, you know, you just take that column and you change it to, say, more, you know, early morning, mid-morning, late morning, or whatever you want to do for those bands, and then correlate that with another column called virality. So the posts that have the highest engagement per reach, you know, and then you can, you know, rank, uh, sort it by those two criteria, and then you'll get you'll start to see the pattern of what time is working the best. Yeah, okay. Um, there's a few more questions here, John, but I, I think just to uh, keep us on track with uh, announcing a winner, I'm going to uh, mm -hmm. go forward with that piece, and uh, that way we can announce the winner within the hour, and if people want to stick around for a few more minutes to answer questions, we can uh, do that. You know, another thing we could do, Mike, if, if you're interested, we can, um, people can post their questions on the tab site Facebook page, and then yes. I, can, I can go there later and just answer them, no problem at all, because the, if you've turned on your replies feature, it might be pretty easy to do that. Yes, yeah. replies yeah. is on, and uh, that's what's on the screen right now. If you want to go to facebook.com slash tab site, uh, feel free to post questions there. And I'm, I'm also asking you, uh, what was your best takeaway from today? Uh, I'd love to have that uh, listed out there and uh, be glad to uh, interact with people's questions there. Uh, let's go to the winner. Uh, let's see, we had over 250 registrants today, and the winner of the Tab Site Gold Plan Free for Life is the Girl Scouts of Gulf Coast, Florida, with wow. uh, Patricia Ramthan. Um, sorry, Patricia, if I said the last name wrong, but uh, Girl Scouts of Gulf Coast, Florida is the winner, and um, uh, our team from TabSite will be following up with you. We have your email address, Patricia, so we'll be touching base with you about that. And let's see, for those of you who didn't win that offer, I uh, just want to give you the discount code for TabSite, and we're going to be using our, uh, the hashtag that we use today, TabSiteNP. And uh, this is going to be valid for a 35% off discount on any TabSite plan, monthly or yearly, for the, the, for the next year. And this code is going to be valid through March 31st. Okay, so that's uh, TabSite NP. I uh, want to make that available to all of you. And uh, there are a couple questions about ways that uh, TabSites can, can be used for nonprofits. 
And so, John, you already kind of referenced one of those, but that is as part of a email acquisition mm -hmm. strategy, uh, you can have a a tab which which leads to a form. So maybe they need to um, you're going to offer them a uh, a resource, a ebook, or some type of information, or you can just say you know sign up for our email list and have that on a tab and a a tab with tab site uh, can be used to for that acquisition so they can build their email uh, list and let's see as well uh, tab site offers you know different types of ways that you can interact as as you heard John talk about the one of the values of a Facebook page is uh, getting the community interacting it's it's only as valuable as your last post and the the interactions that people have with you determine whether they see your content and so um, you know, running some type of uh, you know an Instagram contest or um, a photo contest where people can upload their favorite photo and have people vote on them. And uh, one of the things that we offer is a friend share um, offer. So you can just you can create a tab that um, has a unique image. You know, again, images that capture people's emotions. And we have a friend share tool that allows them to share that to their friends. And uh, that'll go directly to their wall with that picture. So there's multiple, you know, opportunities there um, for the ability to interact with your community and drive further engagement with tab apps such as uh, what we offer with TabSite. And John, let, going back to the questions, there was a question about the new edition of uh, Facebook for dummies. Uh, do you mm -hmm. want to say a little bit more about when the an update of that is coming out? Oh yeah, uh, it's really funny they mentioned that because my um, deadline for the balance of the entire book is um, tomorrow and I'm basically done, like I'm totally done. It's going to be out, um, let's see, it's February, April, May, June. June. So it's, so it's the fourth edition of Facebook Marketing for Dummies. Tons of new stuff, as you can imagine. I mean, basically I had to rewrite the entire book. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, there was a question about: Is there any value for an organization to use Tab Site to create a whole website inside of Facebook? All right. Um, I'm going to take a a stab at that one, and then invite you to comment as well, John. Uh, John, and um, to the question, you know, I think that people need to understand that you know Facebook is a platform, and so the space you have on it. Is you know sort of lease space. It's uh, it's given to you, um, but you know it's separate from your website. I think that it doesn't uh, building out tabs does not replace a website. It's it's a both and rather than an either or question. That uh, it is valuable to have a website destination uh, where people can always go to that's tied to your domain. And uh, your your Facebook is uh, that social community, um, and you can do more things with Tab Site to to build engagement that fosters your community there. Uh, that's that's the benefit and the value of that. John, anything you want to add to that question about website, Facebook? Yeah, I, I mean, um, <clears throat> you have to understand that people are using Facebook actually a hundred percent because of their friends, not really for your brand. So they're not going to spend a lot of time and investment into like going through a lot of links and tabs and whatnot, like an entire website within a Facebook page. Um, it's best used, in my opinion, and Mike might know more about this than I do because he works with like tons of people specifically around custom tabs, but um, <clears throat> it's better to have a very specific goal. Like what do you want to do? We want people to sign this email list. That's all we want. We just want an email list. Develop a strategy around that, and then make that your very specific goal. Because you all, you have an extremely limited time of uh, uh, you know time of attention on Facebook. And the other thing I'll say is that when you create a custom tab, you 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 have to promote it. You just can't say, oh, our custom tabs on a page. Of course, people are going to see it because they're going to visit our Facebook page. Less than five percent of your Facebook fans actually go to your Facebook page. Most of the action happens in the newsfeed. I call it I call it the battleground of engagement. It's totally in the newsfeed. Custom tabs, you have to use Facebook ads, email marketing, all this other stuff to push people to that. You know, updates too, to link back to those to that custom tab. But be very, very specific about what your goal is, what your objective is, and what the action you want that person to take. Maybe pick one goal, 
one action, and you're going to have a much more successful um, use of a custom tab. Yes, yes. Uh, so, you know, the the tab apps work excellent when you have a specific focus, whether it's that you know sign up form, that email acquisition, or running that promotion. Uh, you know, that's that's where it helps build and and offer you um, extended capabilities. And uh, let me see. There's one more question. Uh, so many people using Facebook through a mobile device. In terms of tab site, how's the best way to allow our tabs to be mobile friendly? Is the mobile URL uh, the only way? And um, uh, basically, the answer to that is yes. We have a smart mobile URL solution, and uh, as John said, you know, majority of the time people are going to interact once they've liked your page. They're going to interact with seeing your post in the newsfeed, and so by using the smart mobile URL. In your posts, you know, say you're going to run, you want to build your email list, or you want to run a promotion, a deal, a coupon, a photo contest. Uh, basically, you build out that tab, you get the mobile smart URL, and you use that in your posting. So, you know, in your in your email blast that goes out to your list, um, when you post on the timeline to your newsfeed, if you're going to tweet something out, you're using that smart mobile URL so that when it's clicked on, we can detect if they're on a um, desktop computer or if they're on a mobile device and we can show them the tab appropriately because Facebook mm -hmm. native apps uh, do not show the app tabs uh, with, within their device uh, by clicking on those and so this is a way to, to work with that. Mm -hmm. All yeah, right, well I want to again just uh, post that uh, special limited time offer Enter code TabSite NP. Uh, we also do have a 14-day free trial if you want to try out TabSite. That code for the discount is uh, valid through March 31st, and uh, we are going to be sending out the information on the video, the slides, the uh, marketing download piece, and to just really appreciate uh, you being with us today. And John, for your input, very um, helpful and much appreciated. Look forward to doing some more things with you in the future here. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. Let's do it again for sure. All right. Sounds good. And the uh, last thing, as John said, feel free to go to uh, facebook.com slash tab site. Post your questions there, uh, your key takeaway. And uh, John and I will be monitoring that so we can uh, answer your questions. And appreciate you being with us today. Thanks, and have a good day.